Hi, I am Dr. Felice Gersh, your integrative OBGYN physician, and I'm going to talk about a topic that is really trending now and so interesting to so many women, men too, but mostly women, and that is dosing of hormones for menopause and perimenopause. And what do I mean by dosing? Physiologic dosing. So what is physiologic dosing? Well, there is no precise definition and some different practitioners of different types are using that expression to mean something differently. So I'll define what I feel it is because there is no absolute definition. There is no master of what the definition is. So when we talk about physiologic, what are we even talking about? Something that is consistent with how the body would naturally function. So if we look at hormones and what is the purpose of even prescribing hormones to women who are transitioning in menopause and thereafter, which for some women is at least half of their entire lives is spent in the menopause. So what I am talking about is dosing for optimal healthy longevity. Because if you're going to spend up to or even more than half of your life as a menopausal woman, you don't want to live those many years suffering from a whole array of chronic degenerative diseases that are not about the number of years lived anywhere so much as the deficiencies that you acquire along the path of aging. Underlying aging and all these degenerative diseases of women is the loss of estradiol and it's psychic, but predominantly estradiol as the ovaries drop their production and then cease the production of this vital life hormone. So what is your goal as a woman either entering or you're anticipating or you're in menopause? Remember, menopause is an artificial definition called 12 consecutive months without any vaginal bleeding. And like I've said before, if you bleed after 11 months, you don't start the clock over. We don't know what that bleeding is. It's suspect until proven innocent, okay? And remember, menopause isn't about periods. If you don't have a uterus, if you had a hysterectomy, you still go through menopause. Menopause is about the ovaries and these vital life hormones, estradiol, the estrogen produced by the ovaries, and progesterone. It's very important sidekick. And we're gonna talk more and more about progesterone in coming episodes. And we've already talked some and we will be talking more. But let's talk about dosing. Well, as I said, the first thing to decide is what is your purpose in taking hormones anyway? Well, for some women, the purpose may be, I want to just feel better. I'm having night sweats and hot flashes and I really can't sleep and I don't feel well and it's making me moody. And of course, a lot of other side down, downstream side effects from getting poor quality sleep. So if you want basic, we'll call it basic hormones to suppress night sweats and hot flashes and have the benefits of getting better sleep and not dealing with those, then the reality is all you need in most cases is a very tiny amount of estrogen. I always say preferably as transdermal estradiol, but the reality is that kind of any estrogen product actually helps. So that's where you could give, but I'm not recommending this, but you could take any form of estrogen, whether it's conjugated equine estrogens, a brand name is Premarin, or you use oral estradiol or even birth control pills, which are really touted by some, not me, but, and there are some cases where it is the best choice, but birth control pills and the hormones in them will suppress night sweats and hot flashes. So that is not a ridiculous goal. However, if your goal is something beyond that, okay, if your goal is to have healthy longevity, 
if healthy longevity, what do I def- what do I mean by healthy longevity? That you not only live many years, I always set my warranty at 100. After 100, we have to renew the warranty. But you live many years, but you live them with quality of life. That is so key. You have to have quality of life to have the best life. So that's what we call healthy longevity. Not just number of years lived, but quality of those years. Now, if your goal is, as I said, suppression of night sweats and hot flashes and the benefits that ensue from having that improved, the tiny dose of estrogen will work. That is what is given in most cases. Most of the online companies that are given out hormones are like cookie cutter dosing. They are giving tiny doses of estradiol and they are giving it along with static dosing of progesterone, usually not very high, although it's variable, and given nightly, usually the progesterone pill, micronized oral progesterone, the most typical dose that's given out is 100 milligrams, and occasionally I see other doses. That's the most common. So they're going to give a tiny dose of estradiol and nightly progesterone, and the vast majority of women will feel better and even have complete or almost relief, complete relief of night sweats and hot flashes within a month or two or less on those kinds of tiny doses. Now, why do I not recommend that if, and this is a big if, if your goal is not just in reducing the night sweats and hot flashes and the other side benefits of that, which are not insignificant, but optimizing healthy longevity, then I do not recommend that dosing regimen, which is called static low dose prescribing of hormones, which is the most common. Now, why is that the most common? It's easy. It's easy for the prescriber who actually doesn't need to know much about anything. They don't really know about what to do if you have bleeding or a lot of things because they don't have to have a lot of background in women's health. They certainly don't have to be a gynecologist like me. So they're not really going to give a dose that's going to have a lot of side effects potentially, but unfortunately they're not going to have as many benefits, but they are going to have some benefits. So it's very popular now to give very tiny doses of estradiol and nightly progesterone because on those doses, you do get benefits. A woman will feel better and she probably will not bleed. Now I can say probably, not definitively, because if you have a uterus, even on these very small doses, you may actually get bleeding anyway over time. Now, why would I recommend something else, which I'm getting to? Because I prefer for myself, optimal healthy longevity, not just the lowest standard, we'll say, of improving, which, by the way, is the general standard of care. There is, at this time, no actual medical society that is advocating for the use of hormone therapy in women for healthy longevity. The menopause society says you can use it for quality of life, but they don't actually go into what the heck that means. That's like you define it yourself, which is still a good thing. So I give them credit for that. So healthy longevity means you live your life many years long without suffering the chronic diseases associated with aging, cardiovascular disease, neurological problems like cognitive changes that are negative, mood changes, osteoarthritis, osteoporosis, prolapse of organs into the vagina, incontinence, and we could go on. So these are not conditions I want. I want to do everything to lower the risk of those. So if you give static low dosing, you will have less propensity to bleed, and it's so easy for prescribers to give these little tiny doses, but you're not gonna optimize the benefits. That said, you still get benefit. And I have patients who are on that type of regimen because they tell me, and I give a choice, I don't like dictate what anyone has to have. They say, you know what, I 
will not bleed. I have a uterus. I will not bleed. That is not acceptable to me. I'm 50, 55, 60, 65. I'm not going to have a pretend period. It's pretend in that you're not ovulating, but it's real blood. I won't do it. I will sacrifice some of this optimization because I don't want to have any bleeding. Personal choice. I believe in choice. So what about the woman who, like me, says, I want optimization. I'm willing to put up with a little bleeding, maybe for a couple of days, it's a little bit on the heavier side or just a little bit, and then it's gone like in four days. I'll put up with that for the optimal benefit, okay? So what is then the alternative to this static low dosing is what I have labeled physiologic dosing, also called cyclic progesterone with the goal being to get reasonably, this is not replicating a 21-year-old set of ovaries, but reasonably close to the levels of estradiol that a woman in her 20s would have on average through a menstrual cycle. Now, I have to tell you, there is another type of dosing that is trying to replicate an actual menstrual cycle. Now, a menstrual cycle has variable levels throughout the whole, we'll say, 28-day cycle of estradiol, the estrogen made by the ovary, and progesterone. So let me just review a menstrual cycle very quickly. The first day of the cycle is the first day of bleeding. At that point, the estradiol level is very low. It's like even at a menopausal level. But then it rises, and then around day 12 of a 28-day cycle, you have a giant spike, followed afterwards by a giant spike of luteinizing hormone from the pituitary, and then you have ovulation. After the big spike of estradiol, the estradiol level dips sharply. Then it starts to rise up again, and after ovulation, you have the production of progesterone. So you have rise of estradiol to higher amounts than what was in the first half, called the follicular phase, Okay, during the luteal phase, when the ovary is producing progesterone, you have higher levels of estradiol, and then you get the really high level of progesterone. They sort of plateau, and then if you're not pregnant, they both come down, and they come down, and that creates the low level, the instability of the uterine lining. You have a period again. So that's the cycle. Now, so there are some people, and I'm very familiar with this, that are doing cyclic, rhythmic, trying to replicate an actual menstrual cycle. Now, let me tell you, I think hypothetically, theoretically, this is the best way to go. So what's the problem with that, like replicating as close as you can a menstrual cycle? We have no published data, and trying to do that is no simple matter. You have to be changing the dose during the whole menstrual cycle of the estradiol every few days or even every day. And we don't know, this has to use, to really, really replicate it, you have to use compounded estradiol. Um, it'd be very difficult to do it with any of the commercial products if you're gonna really try to change the dose on a daily basis. Um, and the same thing with progesterone during the second half or the luteal phase. You have to be changing the dose on a very regular basis. And every woman absorbs the estrogen differently. We have no published data. I am wishing with all of my heart that we can have studies and actually establish ways to really replicate a real menstrual cycle. And of course, it's not even the same in all women who are at 25, but there's a range and you wanna be in that range. But that is really hard to do. And we have no published data, but there are people trying to get studies going and someday that may be the absolute best way to do it. The best way to get hormones replaced would be if we had a new set of ovaries. And people are working on that too because there's nothing as good as real ovarian function. So what do I tend to recommend predominantly? So it will be, for most cases, static estradiol 
but at a level that is not tiny. It's a level that is high enough to grow the uterine lining. Now, the uterus is not our target. We don't, we're not trying to rejuvenate the uterus, but it's there, assuming you have a uterus and you have a functioning lining. So we can use it to our advantage as a marker of estrogen function. And, you know, hopefully that will work for most women. So if you want to get optimal benefits from estradiol, this master of metabolic homeostasis, the, the hormone of life itself, you need dose. You need the right dose, a level that's adequate to the task. Everything involves dose. How much you sleep matters. You're not going to get the same health benefits from two hours as from eight hours. Exercise, the dose matters. You're not going to get the same benefits from five minutes of exercise a week as 30 minutes, five days a week. How about eating vegetables? Dose matters. You're not going to get the same benefit from eating one serving of vegetables once a week or seven servings once every day. So you get my point. So dose matters. In fact, there's studies showing that really low levels of estradiol, which is commonly what's given, that the level never even rises above the menopausal level. It just brings it up a little, but it's still actually in the menopausal level. It doesn't grow the uterine lining. That low doses of estradiol are more pro-inflammatory and high amounts of estradiol are anti-inflammatory. Inflammation underlies the diseases of aging. Some smart person coined the term inflammaging. The last thing you want is a body full of chronic low-level inflammation. You will have less of that by far if you have an adequate dose of estradiol. So we're looking for a level that's going to be one that grows the uterine lining. Now, why do I care about growing the uterine lining? Like I said, I don't, okay? I, it's just that it's there. I'm not trying to rejuvenate the uterine lining. It's just that if it's there, then it's going to grow. I cannot put a sign at the uterine arteries and say, hormones, don't enter here. Don't go into the uterus. Go to every other organ, but skip the uterus. I can't do that. If you have a uterus, the hormones will go there. Now, we can use it as a marker of growth factors. So, one of the many benefits of estradiol is the creation of these miracles called growth factors. Now, in the brain, you have things like brain-derived neurotrophic factor, nerve growth factor. These will rejuvenate the neurons of the brain, restore, and also have neurogenesis, even create new neurons. In the bone, growth factors will help to grow new bone, regulate bone turnover. In skin, you get healing, you get beautiful new skin. In the vagina, you get beautiful new skin lining of the vagina. In the arteries, you get maintenance of the healthy lining, the endothelial lining, the intima of arteries. Everywhere cells die, except you know, there are certain cells that are still there from birth, like in the heart, but very few. Almost all the cells in all the different tissues of our body, they have a lifespan, they live, they die. And then they need to replace, be replaced from our stem cell pool with new cells. And estradiol helps to modulate this, to create growth. If you cut your arm, you need to have like VEGF, vascular endothelial growth factor. You need tissue growth factors to create new blood vessels, to heal tissue. All of those growth factors are modulated or like regulated by estradiol. Now, when you get enough estradiol to create growth factors for restoration, rejuvenation, repair, replacement of cells, you're going to grow the uterine lining. In fact, we call the first half of the menstrual cycle the proliferative phase when we're referring to the uterine lining because you're growing the lining. But think of it as growing everywhere new cells and restoring cells. And when you slough the uterine lining, think of it as a purge, a purge not just of crappy cells and old cells in the uterine lining, but purging in the body. 
And there's actually some studies showing that during the menstrual cycle, in a real menstrual cycle, there are crappy cells that are purging themselves in breast tissue. So estradiol works with the mitochondria to control the cell cycle. The cell cycle includes when cells that are crappy, senescent, old, what we call zombie cells, when they commit cell suicide, apoptosis, they kill themselves. But everything is dose related. Autophagy, cellular renewal, like house cleaning within a cell, it's all dose related. Modulating the immune system, everything is dose related. So I want growth factors. I want to repair my skin. I want to grow hair. I want to grow and replace cells that die, okay? So in order for that to happen, you have to have an adequate dose of estradiol. So you're going to grow the uterine lining. It's just part of the package. If you have a uterus, you get enough estradiol to grow and repair, you're going to grow your uterine lining. So you can either celebrate it as a sign that yes, your hormones are working in your body, you're restoring, you're growing, you're repairing, and you're growing and shedding and cycling your uterine lining. Because here's a motto I created. If you grow it, you must shed it. Okay, you can't just keep growing your uterine lining indefinitely. It'll become unstable. It'll fall out. You have random bleeding. That's totally not acceptable. The goal with physiologic dosing and rhythm is to have an adequate amount of estradiol to grow, to repair, to create growth factors. And in the uterus, it will grow the lining. And as I said, if you grow it, you must shed it. So you give the progesterone two weeks to create more of a secretory, the second phase of the menstrual cycle, where in a normal menstrual cycle, you have the proliferative, when you're talking about the uterine lining, you have proliferation for the first two weeks, that's the proliferative phase, and then when the progesterone comes on the scene, it suppresses the growth, and it becomes secretory, that's the word we use, it's like lush and flowers and blooms. So that's an important takeaway, progesterone down regulates the estrogen receptors. So progesterone blocks the growth effect. The proliferation of the uterine lining stops when you add the progesterone. Now, if you give nightly progesterone, every day you get progesterone with a little bit of estradiol, basically you're suppressing the growth by knocking it down every single day by the progesterone. You're suppressing the growth factors by lowering the effect of estrogen on its receptors because that's what progesterone does. So you're negating the benefits that you're trying to create by knocking down your estrogen receptor function. So you won't grow the uterine lining. What else are you not growing? If you're suppressing it in the uterine lining, that's a sign that you're not optimizing it anywhere. It just is, but it's still enough to suppress night sweats and hot flashes. So there's still benefit. So if that's what you want, I support you 100%. And if you change your mind along the way, I support you 100%. I just want to present the facts. The facts are dose has an effect. And if you give a dose to get an optimized effect, and we know the effect on bone is dose related. If you give a tiny amount, you have benefit. You'll suppress loss of bone. But in order to grow bone, you need to have a higher amount. It just, it's not very surprising when I say that, is it? So if you are willing to have a reasonable, more physiologic dose, kind of like a, an average-ish dose, that you would have in a menstrual cycle, and then you give pulsed or cyclic progesterone for just two weeks to then go through a similar, it is not the same as being 21 again, okay? But more similar than getting static low dose estradiol along with static dosing of progesterone on a daily basis. There is never a time in a woman's life when she has 
a hormonal regimen of a little bit of estrogen and a little bit of progesterone every day. That doesn't exist in nature. I always say I'm a simple thinker. If I am going to try to maintain the optimal health of a woman, including myself, after menopause, when nature takes away our ovarian function, I am a simple thinker. I want to mimic nature, not create a new, totally different paradigm that never exists naturally in nature. What is an example of when humans have tried to create something better than nature that didn't really work out? How about ultra processed food? That didn't work out. I don't want to create a hormonal regimen that never exists in nature. I want to give something that is familiar to the body, the way the body evolved, at least somewhat. Okay, remember, if I could get a new set of ovaries, I'd snatch it up and take it. But I don't have that. Trying to replicate the menstrual cycle exactly with the exact little ups and downs throughout the whole cycle, I think that that is a fantastic, brilliant idea. In terms of implementing it, we have no data. It's still kind of, we'll say, not to me. In most cases, not all cases, but in most cases, for menopausal women, it's not yet ready for prime time. And I hope we'll get research and published data on it. And someday in the not incredibly distant future, it will become more appropriate and realistic to be used. And I'm not saying it should never be used. I'm just saying mainstream that is so complex with no published data, it's probably not ready for mainstream prime time at this time. Now, I do have in my course, I have a very slight rhythmic where you have a spike at, at ovulation and you have a little bit of tapering down the dose right before what would be your pretend menstrual cycle. So if you're interested in seeing sort of a modified, very modified, simpler version of how to do a more menstrual cycle mimic, you can check out my course if you're interested. I don't use that on the majority of my patients. Most women, just it's just too much to be changing doses, to be modifying, and we have no published data to say that it will totally change the course of your life. What do we know about the menstrual cycle that also supports doing cyclic, not static dosing, more physiologic dosing. Physiologic where you're using levels of hormones that are similar to what a healthy young woman in her 20s would have and similar to the rhythms where you have two weeks of progesterone and all the time estrogen, you know, in the form of estradiol. So it's similar, okay? It's not replicating exactly, not even by a long shot, but it's more consistent with physiology, with what nature provides women during their healthiest years of their lives. So that is what I'm going for. Now, in terms of, as I was saying, like what else supports that? We do know that when you have the on and off of the hormones, you don't get the tachyphylaxis. Tachyphylaxis is where you have the same thing day in and day out, day in and day out, and there's actually a numbing. The receptors can actually become sort of numbed, and some women who are on consistent low-dose estrogen and consistent nightly progesterone, after two, three, four years, they start having symptoms. It's not like working right anymore. And they may start having breakthrough bleeding, but they don't feel as good because the receptors downregulate when you keep having that, like, like you stop hearing. If you hear like background noise, la, 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 la. After a while, you just tune it out. Like the receptors kind of tune it out and they don't work as well. You need to like reboot your receptors by having this rhythm on, off, okay? So think of it like rebooting. You're turning off, you're turning on. The progesterone comes, it, the, it stops. It comes, it stops. It's like rebooting the receptors, and the reason I think someday mimic, truly mimicking, mimicking the menstrual cycle may become the standard, but it isn't yet, not even close yet, is because we know that there are things happening when you have the peaks of progesterone, the spike of estradiol, you're 
upregulating tumor suppressor genes, you're changing gene expression. So sometime that will probably become the standard or we get new ovaries, you know, one of the two, whichever comes first. But right now, I think based on the state of the art, and what I mean state of the art, all the studies that were done other than the Women's Health Initiative, the like we'll talk about the elite study, the KEEP study, they used cyclic progesterone. They did not have the daily static. The daily static was used with PrimPro in the Women's Health Initiative. That is the last study I ever want to replicate or use any of their products that they used or their lack of rhythms, okay? The last thing I want is to try to replicate anything from the Women's Health Initiative. But the ELITE study and, and the KEEP study used cyclic progesterone. When people say there's no data on cyclic progesterone, of course there is. The main, some of the main studies were using cyclic progesterone. The Women's Health Initiative did not. The other thing is birth control pills. Birth control pills have some pretend, you know, they're, they're not real human. Ethanol estradiol is the most common, not the only estrogen, and all the different progestins. They're like mimics. They're not real progesterone at all. And in birth control pills, they would use both all the time. That's not replicating anything physiologic. That's to stop physiology, to prevent ovulation and ovarian function. So that's not my goal. That may be appropriate if you're trying to prevent pregnancy. So we're not going to go into that. There is a place. But for women in menopause, I'm not trying to replicate birth control pills. I'm trying to somewhat replicate a normal, physiologic, optimally health providing cycle where I give an optimal dose so I can actually activate all the different things that estradiol does, which are dose related I am going to turn on and off receptors by having cyclic progesterone. I'm going to shed the uterine lining so I don't get random irregular bleeding. And I am optimizing for healthy longevity. But if that's not for you, then don't even consider it. Because that requires, if you have a uterus, that you have a fake but real bleed every single month. It's not for everyone, but for those who want it, it's a very excellent option in addition to static, low-dose, daily estradiol and progesterone, which still remains a reasonable option for women who choose not to bleed and prefer to have the benefits that come from that particular regimen. So I hope this answers a lot of your questions about what physiologic hormone therapy can offer you if it's something that interests you.